uh, this is an exciting industry, and we are going to be talking about entering the field of clinical research in 2024. Can you believe 2024 is really just over a month away? This has been quite a year, folks. And in our industry, it is quite a year too. In the industry of clinical research, there's so much happening. There's so much opportunity. And we want to share some insights about what clinical research is and how we can all enter the field and excel and really, really do well. My name is David Silberman. I am the co-founder and CEO at Clinical Research Fast Track. I wanna welcome you all to our webinar this evening. And I have two special guests, two of my favorite people in the whole world because I get to work with them on a regular basis. We have our Vice President of Strategic Growth, Lauren Belina Chang. Lauren Belina Chang is currently based in Atlanta. Um, but she got her start at UNC in North Carolina working in, um, in trauma trials. She was doing a lot of research um, on the psychological neurological reactions to trauma. And she spent a lot of time there. And then she moved across the country to Phoenix, Arizona and was working in the oncology department at the Mayo Clinic. And at the Mayo Clinic, she was developing new trials. She was working on some really exciting studies before starting here at Clinical Research Fast Track. Since 2016, Lauren Melina Chang has been responsible for supporting over 1,500 individuals in the field of clinical research, advance, enter the field, advance in their careers, and um, uh, Lauren, thank you so much for being with us today. It's an honor to work with you. I'm very excited to be here and I'm excited for this conversation. It's great to see so many people here uh, joining us on the webinar. So we will definitely have some fun this evening. And, and we have Lauren Stockwell. Lauren Stockwell is our Director of Outreach and Engagement. And in that role, she travels the country. She meets with leaders in the field. In fact, she's traveling to your town, Atlanta, Lauren, um, where she's going to be on a panel with the Executive Director of ACRP and another Director of um, other leading organizations. Sorry, I don't have it right in front of me. And uh, that she is is a speaker on podcasts, she's a speaker at conferences, and she has helped connect our organization to all these other companies that are hiring our students, our graduates. Uh, Lauren, it's such a pleasure to work with you. Thank you for being here. I am so excited about this conversation, and I'm so excited to help each and every single one of you guys, hopefully on the call, find that next career in 2024. I'm really excited to chat about it today. Yeah, and we're going to start, we're going to, we're going to kick things off and we're going to start where a uh, famous business coach and business leader and author always likes to start. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to Simon Sinek and he wrote the book, Start With Why. So I'm going to go to you, Storm, Lauren Stockwell, first. Why clinical research? Why is this industry so compelling, so exciting to you? Oh my gosh, what a fantastic question and what a great way to kick off this webinar. I think it's so important that we all start with why and we all really take that moment to intentionally enter this industry and intentionally understand why we wanna be here. For me personally, I really connect to the opportunity for us to create more lives and to create better lives and to give people more birthdays and more candles on their cake. Uh, that's always been my passion, always been something that I've really been able to connect to. And, you know, we're not just treating the patient in the bed, we're treating the entire family in all honesty and, and conducting clinical research with that entire family in mind. So that's my purpose and my why. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. And what about you, Lauren Belina Chang? Why clinical research? Why is this uh, industry, a place that you want to be and why so many others want to be in this industry? Yeah, absolutely. I started in clinical research back in 2010. And for me, it was really about finding this intersection of uh, working in medicine, uh, being in a field that's innovative, where you can bring uh, where you can bring creativity, where you can do something that nobody has ever done before, but you can also be home around five o'clock in the evening, right? You can have that balance in your life. You can have a great paycheck, but you can also be changing lives, changing the world. And so um, for me, with a background in psychology, not any sort of uh, medical background, 
you know, I was out there looking around and I, I came across clinical research and I even, you know, when I first fell into the field, I wasn't sure what I was getting into, but being in this industry filled with people who truly want to make a difference in medicine, that fuels my passion every single day, because where else can you really have an impact on not just your immediate community, not just a one-to-one -one patient interaction, but quite literally change the world. Hmm. Wow, changing the world. And we are working in the future of medicine. One of our instructors always says today's clinical research is tomorrow's medical practice. We are literally working in the future. But for me, my why, it's really about the people. In this industry, we're working with passionate people who really want to make a difference. It's not just about the big paycheck that they're collecting. It's about the potential big difference they can make in people's lives and and being around people like that on a day-to-day -day basis oh my gosh it warms my heart um, but i want to go on to really talk a little bit more about this industry how we can get in and but before we do what is clinical research because sometimes uh we hear from people and they're like oh i know clinical research i worked on a lab report one time we did a research in the lab um why don't we start with you lauren stockwell what is clinical research how is it different from that research report you did in college or lab research? Yeah, I mean, to me, clinical research at its basic foundation is the systematic study of clinical trial drug, like of drugs that are being put through the test to ensure that they are safe and effective for a large population. And really, there's so many laws and regulations that go into it. There's so many things that we need to keep in mind as we're conducting these studies. And that's what we really train for is giving people that foundation and that understanding to walk into this career well, well assured and well footed and being able to succeed in that career, knowing that there's a lot to learn. Okay, and Lauren Lin Cheng, what more? What what exactly is clinical research? What are we doing in this field? Yeah, so if you think of yourself or anyone you know who's ever taken a medication, maybe it was over the counter or prescription or or maybe even a device, maybe you have a, a new hip or a new knee that you're taking for a spin this evening, um, any anything within that realm that is FDA approved has gone through a clinical trial. So. This is really the testing of new medications, devices, and therapies. We're putting this in human participants who are volunteering for these trials so we can test if these new interventions are safe. So is it okay to give these to people? Are the side effects too bad or is it pretty okay? And then secondarily, we're asking, is it efficacious? Meaning, does it work and does it help? And so that's really what we're doing in clinical research. I think when people hear research, they think of, you know, kind of these stuffy people following, you know, these rules, just, you know, black and white to a T. Um, and there are, like Lauren said, a lot of regulations and we do have to do things by the book, but there's so much room for creativity and for problem solving, because at the heart of this, we're giving something experimental to a human person. We are working in a field filled with hope. No one enters a clinical trial without hope. And so being part of that and knowing that together we are pioneering something brand new in the future, that is clinical research. Mm -hmm. And that's an exciting place to be. And I see some people are starting to ask questions in the Q&A. And if you do have a question, please put them in that Q&A. We're going to get to your questions shortly, but we want to give a little bit more background about this industry. So first, we know what it is. We're testing these new treatments, and it could be devices or drugs or procedures. And we're testing them in human beings in a really controlled setting in the hospital where we can determine safety and efficacy. But what are the roles in clinical research? So many people come on these webinars and they want to be working in the field. Where, how, where do we start? What are the roles? Um, and uh, Lauren Stockwell, you have helped so many people enter in the field you're going to this conference tomorrow in fact are you you're you're flying tomorrow um and you're going to be with leaders in the field and what are the roles that they're hiring for right now yeah yeah and it's so interesting because this industry has so many different types of roles and so many different opportunities for people with different backgrounds, right? And so depending on your background and depending on what your desires are, it's super important to know that there is a place for you. And there is opportunity for you to take those transferable skills in. I mean, we have 
finance and lawyers. And we had a plumber one time. I mean, there's the opportunity for so many different types of backgrounds in this industry, which is such a cool thing. Um, working specifically um, with industry leaders, there is an immediate need for people at these sites, at people who are really interacting with these patients, running these protocols, ensuring the safety um, of each and every single one of these patients, and really making sure that that is being run systematically at the site level. So that would be your research assistants, your coordinators, your data coordinators, your regulatory coordinators, all these fabulous things. Uh, but obviously there's a whole slew and we could spend an hour and a half listing out all these different job descriptions and all these different job titles, but that's just to get started. All right. And Lauren Belina Chang, what are some roles that we you want to highlight for people starting out in the industry? Um, we hear terms like CRC, CRA, what, what are those? Yeah, so I think one thing you want to ask yourself if you're really interested about entering this industry is, do you want to be patient facing or do you want to be behind the scenes? And if you want to be patient facing, that's honestly, that's where a lot of people start, not necessarily everyone, but a lot of people do start in these patient facing roles where you are working one on one with the participants, you are collecting the data, you're running protocol, you're giving that experimental whatever we are testing to these volunteers who are part of our trial. Um, in those roles, often people can move into management and to leadership positions, but oftentimes people do want to transition to behind the scenes or sometimes even start behind the scenes, in which case I would say, well, you're interested in regulatory. So maintaining the story of the trial for the FDA to make sure that when this goes up for FDA review, that we've done everything appropriately. Uh, maybe you're interested in data management. Maybe you love the programming of the systems. Maybe you love the cleaning of the data. Maybe you love the analysis of the data. Maybe you love the reporting of the data. Medical writing is another great field. Maybe you're really interested in safety. You could go into compliance. You could go into pharmacovigilance or drug safety. There's really a lot of different directions you could go. If you're really scientifically oriented, clinical scientists could be in your future. There's really so many directions to go. And I will say there are jobs that exist today that did not exist three years ago, five mm -hmm. years ago. If we think about things like decentralized clinical trials, feel free to Google that after the, after the webinar tonight. That's a whole field that is really just getting started, but still within clinical research. So I think the first thing you want to ask yourself is, do you want to be patient facing or behind the scenes? And then we can dig deeper into what those roles really look like. And also where you go from those entry points. How do you keep evolving from there? You know where you go but and where you start and i want to talk about where like where are these jobs so if you're going to be patient facing clinical research coordinator where would you be working what 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 type of facility hmm. yeah, lauren so lauren belina chang i'm jumping <laughs> in i'm taking this one david uh because this is where my heart is at the clinical research sites and when i say site i am referring to a hospital that does clinical research I'm referring to a doctor's office that does clinical research or even an independent research site. These are really the three places where research takes place. I think a lot of times people uh, you know, associate this with maybe an MD Anderson, a Memorial Sloan Kettering, even a Mayo Clinic, right? And those hospitals are very well known for the high quality clinical research that they put out. But you may not know that Dr. Smith right down the road offers clinical trials, or you may not know that that place you pass every day on your way to work on your drive in or the way to pick up your kids, they do clinical research and that's all they do. It's a dedicated business to clinical research. So those are the three primary places where you'll see clinical trials. Yeah. Okay. So you're working. Oh, sorry, Lauren Stockwell, please jump in. You're okay. My favorite part about those organizations, you guys, is that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's where you can look into the eyes of patients and say, we may have an option for you and see that connection and really build that hope in that moment uh, for that potential option. So that's what I have seen and heard traditionally from our graduates that are working in the field at organizations like that. And that's something that really feeds my heart and really is part of my why, where I get to help people help other people. And we have our graduates working at UCSF near me, at Emory University near you, at Phoenix Children's Hospital and the Mayo Clinic near you, all around the country. And what therapeutic areas are they working in? Because I know people have a lot of questions about that. Uh, Lauren Belina Chang, what types of trials are they working on? Oh, you're on mute. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, gotcha. Uh, I was coughing. Sorry. Uh, so the nice thing about clinical research is you don't uh, necessarily get pigeonholed into one therapeutic area. So if you think traditionally of a doctor going through training and through residency, if you if you do your residency in psychiatry, you're a psychiatrist. You can't just one day decide to be an orthopedic surgeon and go into work and say, all right, I'm here for surgery. You have to go back through training for that if you want to switch therapeutic areas. One thing I love about research is it's it's unlike that. You can switch, you can move around. So as David mentioned, you know, I started my career in trauma research and then found myself in an oncology department. And so you have that, that mobility. Our graduates are working in virtually every therapeutic area you can think of. Um, if you're really wanting to work in something incredibly rigorous these days, that's going to be oncology and neurology. Mm -hmm. Those two therapeutic areas, we are learning more and more every single day in a very personalized way how to develop and treat patients. Um, not to say the others are kind of slow moving, but those two are really on the forefront. But, you know, there's a lot of primary care research still going on. Uh, there's surgical research going on. There's device interventions. I mean, every therapeutic area you can think of, every area that there's an FDA approved drug or device for there's, there's clinical research happening there. Absolutely amazing. And now I want to switch to, okay, we, we know this is a great field. There's a lot of opportunity. So how do we get into the field? Often these roles they you look at them and it's a coordinator position and it seems entry level. And then it says you must have one to two years of experience. How do we, Lauren Stockwell, how does someone leap on that gap because you you need a job to get the experience but you mm -hmm. need experience to get the job what do you do this is literally what i am speaking on a panel about on thursday and i cannot wait to go on a rant about no i'm just teasing but uh it is so important you guys that you build uh connections sometimes it's more important who you know than what you know and creating that connection and creating that personal relationship and showing them that you've taken that intentional step to educate yourself is enough and we've kind of pigeonholed ourselves as an industry inside of this sense that we need that experience but then we continue to hire people without it. And so we need to figure out the ways that they're looking at these other candidates in a unique, unique sense to make sure that they are finding the right candidate for them and make sure that they're finding creative ways to hire people and bring brand new talent. And that's really our passion over at Clinical Research Fast Track is to empower that next generation, to build a better generation of clinical research professionals that is coming in well-equipped and well-trained. And so that's really what we're doing here today. Okay, so you need some training. You can't just step into the industry because, well, why? I'm gonna ask you, uh, Lauren Belina Chang, why do you need training? Look, you've got a master's degree maybe, you've got a good education, maybe you have a bachelor's in sciences and you worked on a research project with your professor in that lab. What, do you, what more? Um, so a lot of clinical research is really understanding your resources and when to use them. Um, even though we are following protocols and even though we're in a highly regulated environment, a lot of what we do is in that gray area, is in that area where we don't have a clear answer and we need to problem solve, we need to be creative and we need to know who to reach out to when. And that's a lot of, <clears throat> I think the required training. A lot of it is the hard skills. Yes, we have a very particular way of documenting in clinical research. Yes, the informed consent process is much more rigorous in clinical research uh, than what is typically represented in clinical medicine. There's a lot of differences in clinical research that don't overlap with regular clinical medicine. So you'd be surprised when nurses enter training for clinical research or physicians, especially uh, foreign medical doctors, enter our training or any training really uh, for clinical research. They're surprised that yes, that experience does translate in and there's a lot of transferable skills, so phenomenal backgrounds, but this is unlike regular clinical medicine in terms of documenting, in terms of patient interaction, in terms of informed consent. And then at the heart of it, you have to get back to the business side of it too. Um, clinical research is a business. So if you're interested in business, there's a place for you, you know, in, in that realm too. So, you know, I think, um, you know, in, in light of all of that, you have to have that really strong foundation because I always go back to at the heart of what we're doing, 
is giving something experimental to a human person. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're doing a disservice, not just to that person, not just to that study and their families and everyone else involved, but to what hope we could potentially bring the world. Yeah. So, so you really have to understand the code of federal regulations, the processes, the procedures, and the language. Um, there's a lot of of language that's specific to clinical research. And I like, I mean, just in the first day of class, we talk about IP, PI, IB, Lauren Stockwell, what is all of this language and how is it relevant to the field? Yeah, we are swimming in alphabet soup in this industry. And if you walk the halls at any one of these clinical research conferences, it's like they're speaking in Morse code. It's insane. Um, but it's such an important thing that we move very quickly in this industry. And we're trying to get things to market as quickly as we possibly can. And so we have acronyms that mean specific things that are indicative of specific things. And so it's important for us to first learn the language and, and really take you guys through the language and understanding how to speak that language. Uh, and then you can walk into that interview and walk into that job being like, I know what I'm talking about. I got this. I can flip my hair back uh, and really feel confident walking in. That's really a huge goal of ours is, you know, we're never going to be able to teach everybody where to look, but you know how to speak the language and you know what to ask and you know where to look and what to what to talk about. Yeah, it's so important that you have this foundation going into the field. And that's why um, often we meet people who have been trying for years. They've been applying to jobs and they're not quite getting the interviews or they're getting the interviews. And they say, oh, you know, we're looking for someone with a little more, but we have a thousand proof points of our students who walk right out of our classroom into great roles in clinical research. And we do have a question about the roles, mm -hmm. about work-life balance. And Lauren Belina Chang, you said, wow, you know, if you're working as a bedside nurse, if you're working as a physician, I know you know a few physicians, um, they work really long hours. What is a typical day like? I know there's no typical day, but what are the hours like in our industry? Yeah. So, you know, in these patient facing roles, you're typically looking at regular uh, banker's hours. I mean, sometimes you might start on the early side, but then you usually head home a little early. Sometimes you start on the later side, you head home a little late. Um, you know, there's kind of that day to day variation and we really want to be there for the participants. But most of those patient facing roles are not going to stretch you more than, you know, 40, 50 hours on a busy week. But that's a busy week. Um, we really try to keep that quite limited. Now, some of the other roles, yes, they are quite busy. You know, take a CRA, for example. Their hours are much longer because they are traveling around the country to visit sites, to monitor their data, to do really um, quality assurance checks. And so, yes, those can be long and rigorous hours. And uh, we do, I know I see a question in the in the chat there about burnout rate. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, some of these positions do have a high burnout rate. Um, but I do find that when people are not in the right position, that's when we see that high burnout rate. But when you get into the right position for you, that's the right fit for you and your family and that balance that you need, it does exist. And we have plenty of students also working in remote roles. We have plenty of students working behind the scenes in very regular hour type positions. Maybe they're working in regulatory or compliance or data management. Um, so, you know, I think it depends, you know, balance is different for everyone. And so what does that balance mean to you? What does too much mean to you? What's too little mean to you? Some of us want to work, you know, that 50, 60 hour week every single week. So, you know, I think it's less about the, the burnout rate in the overall industry. It's about finding that right fit for you that won't burn you out. You know, one great role that all these people love and want is the, it's a role called a clinical research associate or a CRA. Now, this is a role that you usually work into. And when you're working as a CRA, you get to travel all the time. And I know so many young people, they're not married, no kids, and they are traveling and they love it. And because they're on airplanes, they're seeing the country, they're in hotels, and it's so much fun until they want to settle down. And once you maybe have a family and you want to be in one place and go to your kids' soccer games and music lessons and recitals, then it might not be the right fit. But the great thing about this industry is you can transition into a lot of other roles. That's just one 
place where people are. And what you said, uh, Lauren Blina Chang, about having the right role for you, it's so important, but it also, I want you all to know this, that right role can change. Yes. That CRA role could be perfect for you at one stage of your life, and then you can move in to other roles as you progress. And many people are CRAs, and then they become what's called a team lead or a clinical operations lead. We have um, our students going into director roles. So it's a great way to be in the industry, to really learn the craft and then to advance onward. Um, because when you're in the right role, there is no burnout. You love your job. You are happy every single day because you're connected to your why, to your purpose. It's really powerful. Uh, Lauren Stockwell, um, what is uh, the role that's right for you? Can you tell us a little bit about your role? Absolutely. I joke with David a lot that this is what we call Dharma. Uh, dharma is kind of this intersection to briefly explain it. It's kind of this intersection of what you're really good at, what you're passionate about, what's serving the community, what's helping right? And what's what's doing something um, for the industry and for as a whole for others. And so I have found my dharma and I feel very fortunate to do so. And something that I'm very lucky is that my leadership here on this call with us today uh, talks to me about what I like and what I like a little less. And we've been able to really cultivate this beautiful role where I get to go around the country and I get to represent our graduates. And I get to stand on stage and stand in front of people and say, here's why you should consider this person. I get to speak other people's names out of my mouth to people who matter and people who are making those decisions. And that is something that is so important to me. I always describe myself as kind of like the hub. And then I'm just taking all my little spokes and saying this spoke should talk to this spoke and this spoke should talk to this spoke. Um, and that's something that I've really enjoyed being able to do is be that connector for people and build those bridges. Um, great. Well, thank you so much. We have so many questions. I want to make sure that we get to them. And if you do have more questions, put them in the chat because sometimes people are asking very similar things. And I just want to go to this question. And the first sentence is, what is a good position to start? Where is a good place to start? Lauren Belina Chang, you're, you're new to the industry. Maybe you have some, some science background and other background from where you are now, but you're new to clinical research. Like, where do you start? Yeah. So, you know, again, I encourage you ask yourself, do you want to be patient facing or do you want to be behind the scenes? If you're going to start in a patient facing role, you're going to want to look at research assistant and clinical research coordinator. So depending on the organization, they'll have different entry requirements um, for both of them. Uh, but really, that is where most people in the industry get their start in those patient facing roles, at least historically. And we're seeing a little bit of a shift now um, with with CROs, contract research organizations, as well as sponsor pharmaceutical companies having a bigger presence. Uh, but I would say start as a research assistant or a clinical research coordinator. Now, if you're open to behind the scenes roles. I encourage you to look at these contract research organizations and look at sponsored pharmaceutical companies. They're often hiring in regulatory type positions like a clinical trial associate um, or even an in-house CRA. Some of them have these um, entry level CRA type positions. Some have junior project manager positions. Um, some people start directly in data management. I see uh, someone in the chat uh, wrote that they have a, a background in statistics. I don't know if you want to stay with statistics, um, but there's certainly a lot of data management uh, type positions available out there um, with those contract research organizations, uh, even with sites. And so, you know, where to start? It's a highly individual question. Everyone will start somewhere, somewhere different. Yeah. Um, again, some patient facing and some behind the scenes. So I think that's the first question to ask yourself. And then we can dive into that deeper discussion of what really interests you. Okay. And then there's this question about with limited experience, how do you get in? How do you get in? Um, Lauren Stockwell, uh, how, how do you get in? 
Yeah, it's a really great question. And again, just like Lauren said, it's going to look a little differently for everybody. Um, reading this question, Oyan Demola, uh, it looks like you have such a fantastic background and such a, a, a niche within data and within numbers and, and a desire to clean up those numbers. And I think it's so cool that you have that background. Um, we actually just helped a student with a very similar background to you get into his first career um, as a budget coordinator for an IRB, uh, which is an institutional review board, just for those on the line. Uh, landing roles, sometimes it's not only about what you know, but it's about who you know. And I'm going to continue to poke my, my connections horse and plug my connections thing. It is super important for us to understand how to network ourselves, how to build out that representation, how to put yourself out there and connect with not only people, but the right people and connect and also apply for the right positions as well. What positions we're applying to is super important. So that mentorship aspect that we provided our program is definitely going to be a really huge asset to you. Yeah. And um, Lauren, you're traveling to Atlanta. You're on this panel at the conference. You're going to be with hundreds and hundreds of other professionals. You'll be on stage, of course, and they know Clinical Research Fast Track. And that's how we help connect our students to our colleagues in the field. When they come up and talk to you after your presentation and they ask you questions, you know, many of these organizations are hiring right now, today. Yeah. And when you're meeting, with the people who are hiring, and then we have students in class. It's a great way how we can facilitate those networks and connections. Yeah. Um, and also with having over a thousand of our graduates in the industry, well, they serve as ambassadors for our students as well, because they know that someone helped them get into the industry and they will reach back to our students and help them too. So I think it's really important to be part of a community where you get support and where you have the, the mentorship, as you said, which is provided um, through our program. Um, we, have, we have more questions. There's this one question about being certified. People have a lot of questions about that, Lauren Belina Chang. Can you, can you talk a little bit about certification? Yeah, so certification in our industry is kind of funny um, because you're not actually eligible for certification until you have about two years of working experience in the field. So a lot of times people will think that, well, they need to be certified to get started, uh, but it's actually you can't be certified when you get started. You need to have some experience under your belt to be eligible to sit for those certification exams. Um, I don't think I didn't sit for my certification exam until I had about three and a half, four years of experience under my belt. Um, uh, there's a couple of certifying bodies that do exist. One is SOCRA, the Society of Clinical Research Associates. Uh, the other is ACRP, the Association of Clinical Research Professionals. Uh, both provide great certifications. I think it's something uh, that everyone should be working toward. It's a great thing to achieve and to add to your resume. Sometimes it even comes with a promotion or a bonus or a raise. So I think it's a phenomenal thing to be working toward. And Echoing what David said about, you know, building a community, often when you join these associations, they come with instant community, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you're there with other SOCRA certified individuals, or ACRP certified individuals. And so I encourage you, that's something to work toward, but to get started, you don't need it because you can't have it. <laughs> um, yeah, there's so many questions about different backgrounds now. Um, one person has a medical background, another has a healthcare administration background, um, another has a counseling background. So we have all of you in the audience, you all have different backgrounds, but you have one thing in common. You wanna work in clinical research, you're passionate about the field, you're trained in either the sciences or the social sciences, and all of those backgrounds are really a great place to start, but it's not sufficient. And that's where with our training and support, you can get the necessary experience, learn the language, understand the rules and regulations so you can get started. Um, if someone wants to be more back office, I think this is for you, Lauren Lina Chang, on the back office side, where what type of role would they start in? Uh, so I would typically steer you toward a clinical trial assistant or clinical trial associate. 
Uh, you'll see those terms used interchangeably depending on the organization uh, or an in-house CRA or entry-level data management. Um, there's even some compliance roles or junior project manager type positions. Um, there's a lot of those entry, entry places, but most are going to be focused in regulatory. Mm -hmm. And so that means you would be helping to maintain the story of the trial for the FDA. So there's a lot of FDA regulated forms and documentations that we need for every single trial that we run. And so you'd be part of the team helping to collect that. Um, another area where you could start is study startup. This is kind of regulatory adjacent. Um, it's usually at a contract research organization and you're working with sites on behalf of the sponsor to get new trials activated. Um, great. Well, thank you for that, Lauren. And then we, we have a nurse who's asking a question. We have foreign medical doctors on, on this webinar, but for a nurse graduating, um, nursing is a great field. How do you get into clinical research? It's the same uh, qualifications that you need. You need that experience and that background. Um, Lauren Stockwell, you have had helped so many nurses who have gone through our program get into the field. What is it that they're lacking uh, before taking our program? Oh my gosh, I love working with my sweet nurses. First and foremost, the amount of care that you guys bring to each and every single one of your patients, I commend you. I don't know that I could do it personally, and I just believe so deeply in you. Um, that being said, oftentimes we see the same patients coming in and in and out, and it's the same people, and we're putting Band-Aids on people, essentially. Um, obviously, we're doing more than just putting Band-Aids, but you get my point. Uh, whereas in clinical research, we get to go behind the curtain, and we get to actually create better medicine and get to be able to do things. And, you know, our nurses are so needed in this industry and we need so much of that expertise, so much of that patient care, that, that regulations, all the things inside uh, that we need, uh, you guys have it. And it's so fabulous to me. A nurse though is very highly trained, but we tweak things just slightly, the way that we document things, the way that we see patients, the way that we have to do informed consent, the processes within it, and Lauren can probably add a little bit more color to this as well, but we have to understand this different behind the curtain side of healthcare in order to get into it. And I think that that's the biggest thing that I talk to my nurses about is, you know, we have to take step out of our clinical hat and step into our protocol hat um, and, and kind of wear those shoes a little bit differently. And Lauren, do you have anything to add? Yeah, one one thing that I've noticed about a lot of nurses who um, I've worked with and who've come through a program and I've networked with in our industry is that, you know, starting out in clinical practice, the idea, the goal, the, the maybe dream is that you get to develop this rapport with your patients, you get to help them, you're working with them one-on-one. -on -one. And the reality is that it's the hustle and bustle of clinic. If you're a clinic nurse, you're maybe on your feet for 12 hours seeing, you know, 50, 60 patients a day. That's a lot. Maybe you're in a step-down unit, maybe you're in a surgical unit and it's really stressful and your patients are incredibly sick, but you don't have the time to spend with them that you want to spend with them uh, because you have too many other responsibilities on the floor and before you know it, your shift is over. Um, sure, that's great in terms of working 312s and you get the rest of the week to yourself, but um, if you're really looking for that rewarding interaction between patients and their families, you know, I, I find that nurses do find that satisfaction here in research because sometimes an informed consent visit will take a few hours. Mm -hmm. You know, we just um, had my son in the Moderna vaccine trial for COVID. I'll use this as an example. And our nurse coordinator during our informed consent visit, she sat with us for three hours while we went through the informed consent after we signed the consent, taking a very thorough medical history for a one and a half year old. How, you know, how many questions could there possibly be? Um, she sat with us to explain things, to make us feel comfortable she got on the floor with my son and was showing him toys around the office and let him pick one out. Um, she was our go-to contact for any question we had as part of the trial. She was with us through everything. When the informed consent changed due to an update, she called us immediately and said, do you want to talk about this in person or do you want to talk about it over the phone? And, and just really being able to take the time with us where, you know, my son got to know her throughout the trial. We got to know her throughout the trial. And so I think the, the main difference here in clinical research is actually getting to spend the time, the quality time with your participants, you know, we call them patients in clinical care and clinical research participants, but getting to spend the time, the effort, the energy, and oftentimes 
your participants will want to stay in the trial because of you. They say, I want to go back. Can I, can I start the trial over again? Can I go again? Uh, because of that deeply caring interaction, it's not just this very swift and quick in and out and hustle bustle. We got to get through all of our patients. So if you're, if that's the type of nursing career you're interested in, then, you know, I would really deeply explore that clinical research nurse position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we've worked with so many bedside nurses who have been doing it for a while and and they want to do something a little more, a little different. It can be exhausting, hard on your body after doing bedside nursing for many years. So transitioning to clinical research where you spend more time with fewer participants, wow, makes a real difference. And it's a much better better sort of work-life balance when you're ready to make that switch. So great question. We have a question from an international medical graduate. How do I get experience? How can I volunteer? And the fact of the matter is, this is a very difficult field to volunteer in because remember, we're working on these new medications. There's a lot of intellectual property and um, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and people are really want to protect what they're doing. So they don't just welcome everybody into the trial. And that's why um, people coming through our course are getting hired on, and you have to sign all those confidentially, confidentiality agreements because this is really um, protected information. And once a drug is approved, and what you see is sometimes they're incredibly lucrative for these companies. So for that reason, it can be very hard just to walk in and volunteer in this type of role, but coming and taking our course, getting the proper training as an international medical doctor or a nurse or a counselor, um, all of you who have asked questions, it appears to me already have pretty great degrees and it's just getting that training to make the shift to get you there. I did prepare some slides and we haven't seen any of them yet, but I do want to share just a couple because this is such an exciting industry. Um, this is last month. It's, uh, we haven't even updated. There are 165,000 trials going on in the United States, but this is a global industry, folks. And there's 464,000 trials globally. This information comes from clinicaltrials.gov. You can look it up yourself on the maps and resources section. And what an exciting industry to be in with so much happening. We have so many different roles that we've been discussing. And to get in this field, it's really just about the training, the experience that we provide in the class connections and support and you can enter this exciting field but i want to i want to talk briefly before we close about the future what's happening next 2024 lauren stockwell what are you seeing as the future in clinical research what are the opportunities out there oh my gosh as this industry continues to grow and as we continue to try and solve these medical myster mysteries it is so important that we bring in just as that slide said, more diversity into our workforce, more diversity into the patient enrollment that we're seeing at these sites. So we can actually build medicine that represents the communities that we're serving. That's been a huge focus of our industry and a huge talking point of our industry. Uh, solving workforce issues. We're in a chronic shortage right now. We need good, qualified, passionate people in this industry. And it is so important that we bring people in who know what they're talking about and are confident in what they're talking about. Uh, those are probably the two things that our industry is hyper focused on right now. But that and there's also some some ICHGCP guidelines that are coming down the pipeline, more hard stuff coming down the pipeline. So I'm super excited for what 2024 has in store. How about you, Lauren Belina Chang? What is next in clinical research? Yeah, so you know a couple of different things. Lauren touched on the um, the diversity focus, and uh, about a year and change ago, the FDA came out with some new guidance um, that really spoke to the need to diversify the participant population in trials. And so, as a consequence, we really need to diversify the workforce. And so, that's a really big industry wide initiative and focus that I think in twenty twenty four will really come to fruition. I think the last year or so uh, organizations have really been looking at themselves internally trying to figure out how to shift their focus 
um, through this diversification lens. Uh, the other thing that I see happening, and our industry was heading this way anyway, but uh, COVID-19 really kind of kicked it into high gear, <clears throat> and that's the idea of decentralized clinical trials. So the idea that we need to make these trials easier for participants to access, whether that is completing a remote visit, uh, utilizing remote diaries to record data, better ways to get them their, their interventional uh, product, their, their study medications, um, all of these ways that are much more patient-centric than they have been previously. And more than ever, we're giving patients a voice in the development of these clinical trials. And so another trend I see really happening for 2024 is putting the patient first and really utilizing technology to help us do that. Okay. And, and I just want to add one more thing about technology. People are talking a lot about AI. Well, technology in clinical research is adding jobs because what it's doing is it's accelerating the pace of the preclinical work and getting more drugs, more devices, more treatments into trial. So we have more work to do. And we are actually out of time. I did want to share one more slide. We do have a class coming up December 2nd to 9th. That's the classroom portion. There's also work that you do from home in a learning management system. So the entire course takes about three or four weeks to complete, and you could be ready for 2024 um, taking our class. Um, if you have additional questions, I apologize we couldn't get to all of you. So many great questions in the chat, but please, you can email us at contact at clinicalresearchfasttrack.com. You can call us tomorrow um, or later in the week at 602-883-7944. And you can go on our website or fill out a, a, a questionnaire form and uh, one of us will get back to you. This is a really exciting industry. We started with why clinical research and this is the industry where, according to Lauren Stockwell, we are able to find the treatments and cures to give people more birthdays. And that is a beautiful thing. We are advancing science and medicine. Lauren Blina Chang, one last word from you before we sign off. Yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited about where we're heading in this industry. For me, it's really always been about um, innovation and doing something beyond what we know today. I think more than ever, we're moving into this, this era of personalized medicine, of utilizing technology to make it more about the participants. And I think with that, when we can bring access to more people, to people who've never been asked to be in clinical trials before, that's where we're heading. That's where we can really bring hope to the future. So I'm excited for what the next year will bring. Beautiful. Lauren Stockwell, one last word from you. Oh gosh, just to kind of piggyback off of that, you guys, we get the opportunity to work in this cutting edge of medicine. If you look up the drugs that were approved in this past year, it is incredible some of the innovation and some of the things we've been able to bring to market and 2024 only has more in store. Beautiful. Well, Lauren Stockwell, Director of Outreach and Engagement at Clinical Research Fast Track, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Lauren Belina Chang, Vice President of Strategic Growth at Clinical Research Fast Track, thank you. My name's David Silberman. I'm the co founder and CEO. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Please reach out to us tomorrow via email or phone. We are happy to answer more of your questions, but that's all for tonight. Thank you all and have a great night. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks, everyone.